Amir Eskenderi. I'm the founder and director of Kids Growing City, as you already know. Um, trying to change the world, one kid's garden at a time. I do it in three different ways. Um, I, teach, I have online courses for parents. I teach them how to uh, build kids' gardens at home and teach their um, children how to grow food at home. Uh, I have uh, teacher training online and in person for teachers um, to build successful and sustainable school gardens. Um, and I also have like in-school programs. I have trained teachers who go to schools and run my curriculum, like food growing curriculum in schools. So these are the three ways that I try to change the world, one kid's garden at a time. Um, let's go very quickly through the, um, the stuff. Uh, I have a master's degree in environmental studies. This is actually my faculty, this is faculty of environmental studies. Um, um, and I have two diplomas with that master's degree, environmental and sustainability education diploma, as well as business and the environment diploma from Schulich School of Business here. And I'm a certified permaculture designer. So that's the stuff. But who am I really and why should you actually be listening to me? Because a, a lot of people have a lot of titles and stuff like that. So I'm a mother of two. These are my monsters. Um, almost eight in a week actually and 14. So my older one went to high school this year. They grow so fast. It's unbelievable. Uh, I, I'm born in Iran. I came to Canada in 2001 and, and both of my kids are Canadian born. Thank God. Uh, and eight years of my childhood uh, went through a war that we had with a neighboring country called Iraq. Um, so I have seen it, some stuff that are not very pretty, but the most important thing is that I have been exposed to this mentality for a long period of time in my life. The mentality that says it's a dog, -eat -dog world out there and um, people are really cruel and, and resources are scarce and people go to war to the extent that they kill each other over you know, achieving the resources. But at the same time, I grew up in an ancient culture of love, peace, and abundance. And this, um, the huge difference between what I've been experiencing as a child um, and what I've been being taught in my, you know, the poetry and the art and the culture, family uh, values and all of that that we've been going through. Um, a culture that has people like Rumi, who says, the wound is the place where the light enters you. Or, you are not a drop in the ocean, you are the entire ocean in a drop. Or the idea of tolerance. Um, Rumi also says, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field, I'll meet you there. And this poem from Sadi, which is on the wall of United Nations, it says, human beings are members of a whole in creation of one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, other members uneasy will remain. If, you're not, if you've no sympathy for human pain, the name of human you cannot retain. So that's where I come from. And then, um, Back home, I uh, studied applied mathematics, and um, through the application part of it, I became a software developer. So back home and here, all together, I worked in software development for 15 years before I quit my job and dedicated my life uh, to doing this. Um, when my second daughter was born here, and I was on math leave, I joined Facebook, and through Facebook, I came across permaculture, which literally changed my life because uh, up until that point in my life, because of all the experience that I had back home and things that I've been seeing, um, I had the, the extremist exposure to religion and politics, and I had no faith in any of those two, um, as you can imagine. I was like, there's, there's nothing, there's no solution in this world that would be able to help me do anything to change anything for the better. Because I'm only one person 
and politics is not helpful at all. It actually makes things worse, in my opinion, back then. Uh, religion, the same thing. So, and I didn't know any other solution. But when I came across permaculture, I was like, yes, this is what I can do. This is what I can actually dedicate my life to because I'm not going to go through per what permaculture is because it's not a permaculture class, obviously. Um, some of you might be familiar with it, some, some of you might not be. I encourage you to go and check it out. It is, it is an amazing concept. Essentially, it talks about, it's the, the, the opposite of um, scarcity. It's the abundance mentality that says, uh, if you follow these three ethics and these 12 principles, and the ethics are earth care, people care, and fair share. And there's 12 principles which I'm not going to go through, but if you, do, if you follow these, you can create landscapes that are not only sustainable in terms of food and energy, but they're also regenerative. So not only we're not, it, we're not going to you know, keep the state that's already there, but we actually will be able to regenerate Hello. Thank you. So, uh, and Bill Mollison is the father of permaculture. I remember seeing this uh, very short clip. I wish I brought the clip. I'm sorry about that. But anyway, uh, of, of Bill Mollison reading a newspaper. And, which is obviously filled with bad news. And then he says, Somebody, sometimes I really get um, um, tired of bad news. And I would like the idea of turning bad news into good news. So he uses that newspaper, puts it down, and pokes a hole in it, and puts a potato in, in a bunch of straw, and waters it. Essentially, he creates a design for that newspaper to turn into, I mean, help the potatoes grow and turn into good news and he says uh, in a few months we've been we've turned this bad news into good news and well that was not the only clip trust me I did my research but that was the clip that actually caught my attention I'm like that's that's what I that's what I'm looking for um, anyway long story short again so we set like home and I felt like I finally found a solution so I started to grow my own food at home, in my own backyard here, and then I started to think, why was I not taught this? Because it's a lot easier if you work with nature, which is what permaculture teaches us, it's a lot easier than everybody makes you think to grow food. Um, well, maybe not everything, like for example, I can't grow bananas here, and everybody knows that, but there are a bunch of other stuff that I can grow here, which is, which is if, if you follow the permaculture process, it's a lot easier than you think. And I'm like, why was this not part of my education? Because um, it would have been very helpful, actually, um, uh, to my people, um, to help them get through the, the years of war and the aftermath of war which is like, let's build our country back up after all the rebels and um, rebels and everything, right? So, uh, but it was not part of what we were taught. And then I looked at my older daughter's education who was going through primary school at, um, at that point in time and I was like, why isn't she learning this? Um, at that point in time, in my opinion, it was like, <laughs> duh, like, why do we not teach this in schools? And the answer I came up with, which I to, to this day think is true, is that we've been de-skilled. How do you expect teachers to teach something that they haven't been taught? Like, the teachers are either my generation or the generation before me, or a little younger than me, right? And none of us have been taught this, neither in school, unless we've been lucky or we went to a specific type of you know, private school who was like focusing on this, like Waldorf or something like that, we haven't been taught this, right? Even Waldorf doesn't exactly teach how to grow food. <laughs> um, so most of us didn't, right? So and how do you expect teachers to teach something they don't know how to teach and they haven't ta been taught that even through the years of going through, you know, becoming a teacher, you know, the training that they received to become a teacher this does not exist, right? We don't teach our teachers how to do this. And 
although there are a lot, other, a lot of other obstacles as well, and we will talk about um, those, but the main problem is this, in my opinion, because we need to train the trainers first. Otherwise, how do you expect them to do it? And a lot of people do it, like they really do try to do it, but they don't have the training to do it. And it's really unfair to expect them to be successful when you haven't given them the training that they require. Anyway, so how did Kids Growing City get started? I approached my daughter's school, and it was a private school. I told them, okay, so, and they had after school programs. So they had uh, like ballet and chess and computer programming and this and that. And I'm like, can I offer an after school program? And they said, what do you want to teach? And I'm like, I'm growing food. And they, their eyes shine right away. And I'm like, okay, this, this means that this is something. And they said, that's fine. We're going to offer it to the parents because this was an after school paid by parents per, per child type of very expensive programming um, and we'll see what happens if they like it then we go ahead with it right and it was very very successful we got to full enrollment which was only 15 kids it was a small private school but um, uh, and we went into wait list right away at a time that other after-school programs were suffering um, which was I was like whoa and I was not a teacher right so now I had to actually seriously sit down <laughs> and come up with a curriculum that I could teach here because there was so much enthusiasm and that really um, boosted my energy up and well obviously my first program my curriculum was not the best but hey I did my best at that point in time um, we offered it to the other branches of the same private school and again we got success I moved my daughter to a public school in grade 4 I think and then uh, grade 4 <laughs> And then um, it, this was a pro uh, public school, TDSP public school, and it was not in a very wealthy area, and it was not in a very poor area either. So it was kind of in the middle. So they were not getting support from the parents or from from TDSP. Um, uh, but the principal was uh, she really loved the idea, and I showed her the pictures and, and, and all the success that I had in the private school before, and she's like. After school programs don't work here because parents don't have the money to pay for them. But um, I can pull some, you know, budget from my budget and from the uh, parent council a little bit here and there, and let's do it as an in-school program. So this was the first time that I offered it as an in-school program, and I loved it because instead of 15 kids, I had 80 kids, 100 kids, right? Because uh, like touching a lot more lives. And the sense of accomplishment and the sense of ownership that you can cultivate when you do it as an in-school program, because the teachers are there with you, they learn from you, and they you know, take ownership of the garden, and then they really do take very good care of it. Uh, in an after-school program, you really have to struggle to find somebody to water it during the, the week when you're not there, and blah, blah, blah. So there are a lot of, so I discontinued my after-school programs right after this, and I went to more and more public schools and other schools and private as well and I offered it as an in-school program which was which was a lot more successful so so throughout those you know trying outs in, in this school and that school private and pu public and all of that I saw the pain points that the teachers and the admin staff have while dealing with the school garden um, uh, curriculum connections so um, I became a TDSB educational partner, which is a long process, and there's a reason for that. Uh, they went through my curriculum and they had a bunch of very good su suggestions. We have actually Pam here, thank you so much for reviewing the curriculum. Uh, your feedback was very helpful. Um, so Pam and Jen, uh, if you have, who, who here is from TDSB? Okay, so Eco Schools. If you had any questions from them, they're, they're, they're very well connected with eco schools, so you can um, just, sorry to put the spotlight on you, but I think that's important <laughs> to announce. So, um, so fine-tuned and fine-tuned and fine-tuned my lesson plans, getting feedback from the teachers, students, anonymously, obviously, and the admin staff, all of that. So it grew and grew and grew, offered it to more, more and more schools, and I would like to show you some of the pictures of some of the schools. This is a YRDSB school. 
Um, this is a, actually a keyhole garden and it is a hugo culture, which is a permaculture technique. I'm not going to get into te technicalities at all here because this is more strategic type of uh, session. Um, but permaculture helps a lot. Um, this is, and this is not posed picture, by the way. They were actually involved doing that. And I was like, ah, that's a picture, that's a picture. Right, because their faces don't show and there's a little bit of diversity there, so I that, that so there's no boys there, unfortunately. But there's boys in this school, so why are this yeah. school? <laughs> um, anyway, this is one of my teachers, Kirsten. Unfortunately, she couldn't make it today. Uh, wonderful, wonderful woman. Uh, she's also a permaculture designer. Um, that's another picture of her. We are planting seed, fall seeds here, and this is their. You can see partially their um, uh, spring garden. We have a 10-week program for spring and a 10-week program for fall. Um, this is another TDSP school, another TDSP school, and this is my teacher assistant, Hannah. Um, she's, she's also very awesome. And kids got, get very creative, so this is um, one, only one example of how excited kids get when they harvest, like the harvesting is the one they love the most. Harvesting food and harvesting seeds, especially harvesting seeds is very exciting. Um, and we do that in our fall program. Um, so they come up with really creative ideas of, I mean, I, I call that art. Um, this is a TDSP school. We had, they had a snack program. Um, right in front of the office and for weeks and weeks in fall uh, my students were able to contribute to their snack program which made them really proud so they would take them there were there were people who were um, in charge of the snack program so they knew how to wash it and make sure that it's clean and all of that so they would take the, the students would take the harvest to them and they would prepare it and put it um, in front of the office for kids to snack on essentially uh, another, the, this is, these are edible flowers. We always have edible flowers in our school gardens because they're like beautiful and they attract beneficial insects and they're also edible. Uh, seeds, again seed harvesting is a very important part of the fall program. Uh, another harvest. This is a private school, another harvest. A TDSP school. I'm going to go through this quickly, a YRDSP school. And this is, um, so permaculture teaches us to use whatever you have uh, available to you before going out and you know, spending money to, to import stuff. And this was a fence, it was not an adjacent fence to another neighbor, so there was no neighbor on the other side, because if that's the case you can't, you can't use that unless you have permission from them and all that. You have to have your space from it. But this was the other side was street, so we could use this fence to grow up, um, and that's what we did. This is a private school, and I have permission from the parents, by the way, to show the pictures. <laughs> and this is a, um, a principal in one of the uh, TDSP schools. I just wanted to show you happy principals and happy VPs. This is a YRDSP school. Do you know them? No? Okay. Um, another YRDSP school. This is a smoothie we made at the end of the fall program um, from the veggies. And we also added chocolate and vanilla, obviously, <laughs> because you want to get the kids to actually drink it. Right? Um, really happy admin staff. Because our programs have no pull on them. Happy teachers, another happy teacher. And this is a picture because the st students know that I'm not allowed to take their pictures. So they come up with very creative ideas sometimes. Like, but we, we want to have a picture and we want to be in it, but our faces shouldn't show. How about we do this? And my teachers are really um, creative sometimes in taking these pictures. So this is obviously when we harvested our sunflowers in one of our schools. So anyway, building those relationships, I got my permaculture certificate. This is not exactly in the order of dates. I'm just telling you everything at the same time. I quit my job, 
to de dedicate my life to this and I hired and trained teachers. You saw some of them in the pictures um, who actually go to the schools and run my curriculum now. And I went to school. I came here to York University, uh, got my master's degree in environmental studies. And doing that, I did two things. So as part of my major project, I researched the obstacles in the way of school gardening. Um, and I also built an online course um, for teacher training because I really believe that the biggest obstacle in the way of school gardening is teachers not knowing how to do it. Um, so it's called DCP school gardening formula or system. It's for design, curriculum and planning. Those are the three um, main components that I think has to be in place for a successful and sustainable school garden. If you miss any of these three, you will have problems, uh, big problems actually. All right, I want you to imagine your gar a garden at your school. You might already have one, you might have none. It might be successful, not successful, good experience, bad experience. You just think about a garden in your school. And before we move on to that, can I ask how many of you are actually principals? You're all teachers. Who is not a principal, VP, or a teacher? So what is your role? Um, I actually work for a landscaping company, and I'm a, I have a Bachelor of Science in Environmental Science. And um, so I started landscaping, and then um, my boss approached me to stay and offered me an environmental position. And so um, I had a few ideas, and one of them was like starting to um, do, like, as charity, build, like, um, like pollinator gardens and stuff at schools and also like vegetable gardens. Awesome! Um, we have a school that we're going to be working with and I'm going to be like testing this out so everything you're saying is working. Yes! <laughs> it's awesome, it's awesome. You know what, there is no, what do they call it, competition in this field and that's so sad. I, I really would like to see more and more people come into this area and because one person cannot cannot do it all, right? We do need, so thank you for coming here. What was your name again? Madison. Madison, okay, welcome. Welcome everybody else, so that is good. So you are the teachers, so you can actually do this exercise without having you put yourself in your teacher's shoes. Um, okay, so I want you to write down the answer to this question. I'm gonna give you two minutes to answer this. If I were to put, be put in charge of running a school garden in my current school, one, what would be my first step? And your first step cannot be that I'm going to go out there and put a team together. Okay? In real life, that would probably be the best thing you could do. right? But for the purpose of this exercise, okay, that, that's an easy answer. Which, which, will, which will help you escape the actual, to actually think about this, right? So think that, that as if you were completely alone, there were no parents to help you and there were no other teachers to help you, which would not be the case in real life, but if you were completely alone, what would be your first step? Okay? And what is your biggest concern? Okay, so please write down the answer to these two questions and let's do it let's do two minutes do you want to share who wants to share location and money <laughs> so what's your first step so the first step would be to I, I would talk to the principal the caretaker and the parent council that would be three steps <laughs> Okay. To see if it's okay, because okay. some caretakers don't like positioning. Some friends, you know what I mean. You have to figure out, uh, you know, where we put the ge geographical location up. It's huge, and also if we have money. So talk to those people. Talk to the principal. Okay. Uh, I do a lot of research, learning, and connecting 
with organizations, people, anybody that I can get information from first? Okay, so remember I said you're alone and you have nobody to help you? That, that's, what it's, that's, a, that's an awesome answer and that's probably what you should do and that's why probably you're here and it's, it is awesome. But I want you to think a little bit further than that. I want you to think, okay, so if I, with, 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 without knowing anything else other than what I know today, to actually physically make it happen, what would I do? To put a team together, to go and connect with other people that I don't, you know what I mean? No, so like, I, I don't agree because I, I would never. If I know nothing about something, mm -hmm. I would never. Uh, like, okay. I can't start a garden without researching school oh. gardens. My first Google search would be school gardens. <laughs> <laughs> I would. Okay, research them. Okay. Because you can't talk to any of those people without having the research behind you anyway. Right? Like, you can say, I like to which which comes back to the de-skilling that I was talking about and the main reason, which is, I, yeah. so I do agree. I yeah. do agree. Yeah, go ahead. Home Depot. Home Depot. What do you mean? Um, for me, the minute I thought about this, I was like, um, I'm just going to go to Home Depot and buy pre-made plants. Okay. So you would buy uh, transplants. I choose the spot in the school where I would Okay. Um, after choosing the space, I would think about the goals and the design. Okay. Awesome. Anybody else wants to share? Um, like we already have like an existing space and planters, so I would be doing research about um, the quality of the soil that's required. Like we have um, planters that are full of clay, and I know that doesn't facilitate great growing because we've already tried it. So, like doing research on what kind of uh, modifications to the space need to happen, and do I and and getting approval for carte blanche, kind of uh, like changing it. Like, do I have like authorization to change the landscape, lift so saw, you know, create a bed, stuff like that. Okay, so if you were to pick one, well, the the one the most that, important one. Realistically, truthfully, just working with the planter beds that already exist and improving them. Okay. Like soil quality, location, in terms of like a, uh, like a sunlight, things like that. You know? Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, so yes. Just wanted to say we started something this year and we wanted to start with easy, so we planted flowers to start with, like not an edible garden, but something that will hopefully grow and oh. get us started on it. So okay. we planted two of bulbs in the fall. That okay. Was our first step. We put the soil down, same thing. We had the planters, we put the soil in the Okay. So what would you do this year? What would what would be your first step this year? I guess assess how well it went. Yeah. What what next steps we could promote? Yeah, I mean yeah. we now know that there's interest with the students. They were really enthusiastic, so that's good. And uh, we only have one, two grades one, two, and three at our school, the primary school. So we did one thing with the grade ones, and that was planting the tulips. So our next step is going to be to do something with the other two grades, and in another space. So that would be more. Uh, our next step would be more creating a garden where there's nothing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's what we're actually planning on um, doing. So I guess we can say getting more students involved. Um, let's say connected to the garden. All right, so concerns. I'm sure you have a bunch. 
Yes. Budget. Budget. Is that how you spell budget? Yeah. All right. I, I'm not from around here. <laughs> it's been many years that I've been in Canada, but English is still my second language. Yes. Um, sustainability um, in terms of being able to sustain the garden and then also the area that the school is located. Very important one, actually. The harvest itself is not uh, sufficient. Say that again? The harvest itself is not sufficient. Uh, and what do you mean? Like, uh, not, suffi not sufficient? Not sufficient. garden, everything set up. So, I've been here, this is my first year at the school. Mm -hmm. so I have no experience with that kind of garden. So but it is set up yeah, for you. Okay. Up. So, when we do harvest, essentially, <coughs> how the yield is a good yield, not a good yield? For the students themselves to use the first map, for example. Okay, so do you know what the what the goal is? So last year they grew like uh, turnips and kale and all different kind of vegetables, and then the students, the middle school students, made things and uh, lower elementary school, they all made the, uh, snacks and whatnot. Awesome. So this year I'll be in charge of doing something with my class, so just kind of figuring out what to do and. Like, Right. So, in terms of being sufficient, I just want to understand. Like a good yield, for example. Like okay. How to growing practice, like how to grow it. Okay. We will actually talk about that. Um, so let's, f for now, let's say good yield. What about summertime? What do you do in the summer? When we're I, I was actually surprised I didn't hear that at the at, yeah. the, at the top, right? Because that's everybody's concern. Summer. <laughs> Okay. The biggest concern we're facing is we're one of the only schools in our board that the city owns our building. Mm -hmm. they told us we're not zoned for this and it would take up to quite a few thousand dollars to rezone our school. You have to rezone it to, okay, to, to, use the, to use the ground. Okay, but can you do planters? Can you do on the concrete? I need a permit in my classroom after 3.30. Which, which school board is that? Westman, uh, we're in York region. We're at the only school owned by the city. To put soil in a pot and a seed? That's all important. In your own classroom? In my classroom, it's fine. We okay. have um, hydroponics labs and everyone. Awesome. But anything, we're attached to a daycare, and so we have issues of bees and uh, other things. So right. The city's interested if we pay the money for something. <laughs> <laughs> of course they would be right? I'm going to put that down because that's something I would like to talk about if just like um, plan services and, and their rules but also as an extension the preferences of the caretakers let's put all of that into policy okay. w w one second one second one second Oh, let's see. Okay, sorry, go ahead. I was just, you know, I, without, he ran over the last thing we did. Um, <laughs> so I just wanted to get his yeah. approval so he didn't run over this year's project as well. I was saying that we're going to start in Ireland, but they said, where? We have to run lawn tours over it. You can't have that space. So. I can confirm they do run lawn tours over it. Yes. If it changes their job description or their. The of the work. Uh, exactly. The I know. I know. I know. I know. You cannot expect anybody to do anything outside of their Another thing written responsibilities. Another thing is making um, it accessible for all students or mm -hmm. students that have special needs. For example, if they have to bend down and do things and they're in a wheelchair. I mean, that's, that's Accessibility, a double S? Yeah, yeah. Double S. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. I think getting, uh, sharing the responsibility to, because one person might be very enthusiastic and there might be lots of kids that are enthusiastic, but one adult with lots of kids and a big project is very hard to. Very important one, and we will talk about that extensively today. Um, so. Um, I 
I hope you can read it. Pretty. Can you? I'm sorry about my handwriting. We, we, you know what? You know what I wrote. You were here. <laughs> okay. All right. Shall we move on? Yes. All right. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh huh. All right. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research, my findings, and as well as my experience and how I ended up with the things that I'm going to suggest to you um, here. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the common mistakes. These are through my research and all the experience that I have throughout these years with private schools and public schools, seeing programs being run as after school programs, as student clubs like garden clubs or eco clubs, um, as in school as well. This is what I see, these are the mistakes that I see most people make. So if you don't make these mistakes like after you live here, if you don't do anything else that I tell you, but don't make these mistakes, I think you're going to be well ahead of time, well ahead of everybody else. Biggest one, which actually is related to this, almost everywhere, almost like I have not seen anybody not making this mistake. Adults. Sh uh, shoulder the gardening responsibilities. Do not make this mistake. No teacher, no admin staff, no caretaker, or no parents touches my school gardens. They do in summertime. If there isn't a daycare in the school running throughout the summertime, they do. But only, so during the school year, everything should be done by the students. Do you have to coordinate that, assign tasks to them? Do you have to have a curriculum that you run with them? Do you have to teach them stuff that are related to gardening that are connected to the entire curriculum and your curriculum, all that stuff? Of course, and that's good enough amount of work for you to do, okay? But the actual physical work, should not be done by you. If you do this, it's going to be a lot of work for you. And you'll do it for one year, two years if you're the nicest teacher in the whole world, and the third year you're going to say, no, nope. you're going to feel unappreciated because nobody else is going to help you. If you're lucky, maybe some parents sometimes here and there will help you, but it's going, it's going to become your thing. It's not your thing. It belongs to the students. It's a teaching tool. Okay? And if they don't get, get their hands dirty, they're not going to learn anyway, so what's the point? Right? Um, number two, garden is planted as part of a one-time community event or casual student clubs, like eco clubs or garden clubs. If you have an eco club, if you have a garden club, keep it, that's awesome, and get them involved. But you can't run a, um, a program that teaches students how to grow food by inviting their parents. Like community events are awesome because you do want to engage the community as well. You want them to know about your garden and you want them to come forward and say, do you need help during summertime and all of that, right? But the actual work should not be done by a one-time event that you invite community and they come in and they come in with their plants or you go and purchase plants and bring the plants and they you invite them and they come and plant it and then what who's going to water it did the students learn anything other than the community that it's awesome to have community around but actually growing food did they learn anything not much right um, casual student clubs don't work. They just will not work for school gardens. I have seen this so many times and teachers who've been trained by me because when I go to my in-school programs, um, let's say that I go to three, school, three classes for 10 weeks, those three teachers, are tra I train the teachers because my, my business model is not a repeat business. I would like to go to more and more schools. And I would like, and part of the sustainability is to have teachers in the school who are interested, obviously, to be trained to, to continue to do this, right, the next years. So 
I have had teachers who I trained, they saw me do this for 10 weeks in fall, 10, 10 weeks in spring and 10 weeks in fall, and they saw me do it as an in-school program during the day, and the next year they still got, like they got everything else out of my program and they put it into a um, student club and it didn't work. The reason for that is that student clubs are casual. One day you get 10 kids really excited and you teach them about seeds and germination and how to seed, how to create transplants. The next week there's another 10 students. They don't know the stuff that you taught to the first students and the first students are not going to learn the stuff that you're going to teach to the second one. You don't know how many kids are going to show up. You can't plan it ahead of time. You don't know if you're going to be able to get the work that you planned for it done because a garden requires work and it requires a schedule and it requires structure and student clubs don't have structure. Okay, So I know a lot of you are like, mm. Uh, because that's what you wanted to do, isn't it? Try it, but trust me, I've seen it fail many, many times. It's going to be so frustrating and at the end of the day it's going to be you who's going to do all the work. Oh, okay, so today, oh, nobody showed up. Anyway, I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do it myself. I'm going to do it myself. The students don't learn and you shoulder all the responsibilities. So what do you think is the main purpose of a school garden? Just think about it. If you were to write down... I'm sorry, but your conversation is distracting me. Um, if you were to write down the main purpose of a school garden, so what would you write down? Why, what's the main purpose? Right? All, all, the, all the nice things that m might come with it are fine. But if you were to choose one thing, what would that be? Maybe teach student responsibility. Okay. Uh, skills that they can use for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Okay. Environmental awareness. It just, where does my food come from? It doesn't come from a cellophane the wrapped package. Okay, awesome. Any other suggestions? Just piggybacking onto what you just said, if we can go even deeper, into learning about hunger and the fact that the systemic issues around food and the lack thereof. Okay, are you in a high school? No. Primary school is fine too. It was just like, uh, yeah, because in high schools, those types of topics, gold, right? You can, you can definitely, yeah. So, but what's the main purpose? So we had one, um, can you, um, I'm so sorry, can you repeat what you said? Uh, I was uh, talking about uh, teaching students responsibility. Okay, is there any other way you can teach your students responsibility? Do you have to have a school garden to teach them responsibility? So what's the main purpose of the school garden? Because it can't be teaching them responsibility, because you can do that in other ways, right? Teach them how to grow their own food. That's really, that's, that's really it, right? That, that's the, the, the thing, and connecting them to the origin of their food as we had it here, right? So in, like an environmental awareness, again, that can be taught in other ways too. The best way to create environmental awareness about food, yes, it, it is teaching them how to grow food, but teaching them how to grow food is your main thing. To teach students how to grow food and connect them with the natural origin of their food. So that's the main thing. Anything else? So now going back to this, if the adults take the responsibility, if they do the work, if the community come in and plant stuff, if it's casual student clubs, are you achieving the main purpose of the school garden? No, you're not. So essentially you're wasting your time and budget and all of that. So don't make these two mistakes. Number three. Another, it's kind of a design mistake that I see a lot of people make. They hide their garden or lock it away in the fear that it's going to become an eyesore or that it's going to get vandalized. Okay, so let's, let's talk about this. Who here thinks that gardens should be hidden or locked away? And that's okay. 
Okay, wrong question. I shouldn't. I shouldn't <laughs> ask. Nobody's gonna raise their hands. Yeah, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the person who thinks that. But a lot of people do, because they think, what if it didn't work, right? Oh my God, I went all the way to my principal and this and that, I convinced this person and that person, I went through the school board, through eco school, this and that, I got permission, blah, 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 blah. And all of that, what if it doesn't work? And all this time that I spent, right? How about I put it somewhere that nobody sees, so that in case it didn't work, then it's not in everybody's face. But guess what? That's exactly why it will fail. Why do you think that is? Any suggestions? Out of sight, out of mind. Out of sight, out of mind. I've seen this mistake so many times. Don't hide your gardens. If students are not playing in recess time in the garden, if the parents don't see it when they come in and go, I don't know what that sound is. Weird, right? <laughs> Are we taking off? <laughs> I hope we're not. We weren't supposed to go anywhere. Um, so yeah, that's exactly why it will fail, because out of sight is out of mind. If you lock it away, if your students, every time they have to water, they have to go get a key, because they already have to go get a key from, from, from somebody for the hose, right? If they also have to go and get a key from, for the lock, for the gate, they just won't do it. It becomes so much work. And you're on, on a schedule in a school. You know, it's not like you can wake up in the middle of the night and say, oh, I forgot to water the garden today. Let me go and water. It's not a home garden, right? It's not a community garden either. It's a school garden and the students are going to do it. And if you're putting all the time and energy into organizing them, assigning them the tasks, and they go and hit roadblock after roadblock, they're just not going to do it. And they're going to drag their feet on your nerves every time that they have to do it. Right? And you don't want that. You want, it, you want to make it easy. So don't put it behind locked gates and doors. And don't do it. Does vandalism happen? It does happen. But you deal with it. That's part of a school garden. Okay? Does it happen all the time to every school garden? Absolutely not. But ha have I seen? Yes, I've seen vandalism. But if it is in the community's face, they will see the vandalism. They will report it. Students, like I had this school that they, we had, we had sheet mulch the whole place anyway, cardboard under the, under the pathways and anyway. So they were uh, over um, weekend, Actually, there were students of another adjacent school, like a very close school, that came to that school and they pulled all the cardboards from below the, the mulch and they put the mulch back. Just like nothing happened, right? But students of that school saw them while they were walking by and they knew them, so they went to the principal and that principal called the principal of the other school and that was it. And they had names and everything. But imagine if this was, you know, hidden in a corner and they found out about the garden and they went and did that. Nobody would have seen them, right? So there's, there's pros and cons when it comes to vandalism. When it's in everybody's faces, it attracts more people at the beginning, but they will learn how to deal with this school garden. They will learn, okay? Don't lock it away, don't create obstacles, and don't hide it. Because if you don't hide it, people will see it and then, then they will come to you, right? They will come to you and they will say, can I help? This is amazing. This is awesome. You will attract parents' community and they will come and help you. They might know somebody who, who has access to free soil somewhere or they might know somebody who can give you, you know, free planters or, you know, donate stuff. And so you, you want them to see it. Uh, okay, so I want you to think about your own school garden, the one you already have or the one you are planning to have. You might not actually, whoa, we want to take our break, break very soon. Um, and if, if it's current, is it locked away or hidden? You might not be able to change that, but if you can, I would strongly suggest that you do, okay? And if it's a future garden, where would you put it and why? 
thinking about it being in everybody's faces, it being in the middle of the recess so that the kids can go in there. Don't be afraid of the kids. The kids need to learn how to behave around your school garden. That's part of the learning. Yes? Um, one of our special needs schools has bought the Lee Valley trucks. Uh, they're kind of like a, an upside down triangle so that the students in wheelchairs can come up next to it. And the trucks are on wheels as well. Mm -hmm. So that they put them out when the kids are there uh, so that everybody can get around. Do you recommend or have you had success with um, beds on wheels? I have not experienced it myself. I've seen it. The good thing about having beds on wheels is not, I, I wouldn't bring them inside because you do need sunlight. Right. So those are perfect, I would imagine, for places that don't have, like you can't have one spot that gets enough sunlight. So you do need to move it around to get it to sunlight, but that's extra work and you really have to think about the process and who's going to do that and are we going to forget doing that and you know, it does create that type of thing, that, that type of process of operating it around it, but if you are okay doing that, like putting the process around it to use the wheels actually. Well, and the only issue that seemed to come up, um, because they seem to be in a good neighborhood, or uh -huh. it's an older school that they took over, but it was the worry about the stability. Oh. If one of the kids leaned on it or something and it moved on them, uh, and their inability to... So there's no locks on the, on the wheels or anything like that? I don't, I don't have experience with that, so I don't know exactly. But yeah, and those are, I'm assuming, expensive? Very. Yeah, and so it's not accessible to, it's physically accessible to students, but not, not accessible in terms of um, pricing, probably, to a lot of people. There's a lot of land. There's a lot of land. There's a lot of lawn. Um, and usually raised beds are, are cheaper than things like that. But if you, if you can afford it and you have special needs students who, that's, it's good to know. Awesome, thank you. Okay, yes. Um, for me, I have to prove it inside before I can get outside. You have to prove it inside before you can get outside. Yeah. How, okay. Huh. I wasn't so planning to talk about that, but that's very important actually. So. How are you convincing people? Well, that's what she said. I can get one of the raised beds, mm -hmm. and that way the classroom gets a lot of sunlight, and I can even move it into the common area if I have to and leave it. Oh, with wheels, you mean? Yeah, with wheels, and move it outside, like inside the school, but like to the wet, the well lit common area, which is like this, and leave it, and then wheel it back. But I can't have outside until I've proven. Yeah. Okay, so because those are expensive, like it's, it's, it's a, I don't know how you can convince people to get you something expensive that's going to be, like, yeah? You think that's easier to do? Even the Eco Club, they even vouched that I get that, so that's... It's fun for the yeah. kids to wheel things around, <laughs> but you is not the one who should decide this. So the design is yours. I, I know a lot of you would love to, you know, get your kids involved in the design. If you're doing that, be very careful about what they suggest. Ultimately, you're the one who should design it because things that you have to think through in terms of the processes, in terms of the work you're creating for yourself, you want most of the stuff, all of the stuff, if, if it was up to me, to be done by the students. Mm -hmm. um, and you do need to wheel things around and do stuff like that. You really need to think about, think through the process and who's responsible for that and how are you going to assign it. It, it sounds easy because it's on wheels, but be, be careful. Be careful with that. Yes? So we have a couple issues in terms of doing raised beds. Mm -hmm. uh, TDSB, uh, you can't grow food in our soil. In the ground. Right? You have to have it tested. So 
and our schools do need to have a design consultation with our school grand greening experts so that they can help advise. Which is so awesome. We always want the school to be coming up with the ideas, but there's some things the schools won't know, like is a portable going into this area that you think is a great location for your garden, but you know we have to talk to planning because we don't know what, oh, you know, is the school getting an addition? So there's all those things that the teachers and even the principal may not know, right. that other departments, and that's where coordinating with us and you know getting the expert advice, but working with the school to you know come up with what it is they want, right? And obviously we're always working with the school. It's it's awesome that TDSP has that. Not every um, school right. board has that. Yeah. So that's awesome because design is something that you would you you want to do right, right? And you, again, you don't want to put your garden somewhere that's going to be a portable next year, right? Um, and wheels come in handy in those situations because if you can wheel it around, then, right? So there are, yeah, depending on the, on, on the circumstance, those could work. But another thing um, about, thank you for sharing that. Another thing about, because um, one of the things that really convinces principals to go for a school garden is taking the kids outside. So using that card, <laughs> if we want to call it that, you might be able to because oh, take them outside, you know. Sp the, the wheels, yeah, they can go outside. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and yeah. we were talking because uh, there's a Green Industries uh, high school course that I think your students might be interested mm -hmm. in. And so another department of that green industries could actually develop the cart. They don't have to buy it from the valley. Oh, that, that would be the best. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that would be the best. Are you in high school? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that that you can do. Yeah, yes, awesome. All right, so let's move on because we are really, really late. Um, I want to finish the common mistakes before we go to a break. Um, so place uh, the garden away from water access, which again, design expert, if, if you can bring somebody who gives you the design expertise that you need, that's awesome. If you don't have that type of per person, then really think about water and sunlight. These two are really important. I know you know that plants need water and sunlight, but you won't believe how many teachers and parents don't take it really seriously okay so how, how much sunlight do you need obviously different plants need different amount of sunlight and all that but you don't want to have to go research a million hours of you know to, to find out about every one of them I'm going to give you a rule of thumb you need at least four hours of direct strong sunlight to be shining on top of your beds on wheels or whatever so you might need to move it around and that's fine but um, four hours at least and I'm not talking about the type of sunlight that kind of shines, shines through the branches of a tree no four hours of strong direct sunlight okay and water is very 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 important because if you don't water if your students don't water the garden done Water is really important. It has to happen every day unless it rains. And in order to do that, you need to have a non-heavy hose. I really suggest you get those ones that stretch. If your water is not very close, right? Um, and there are, those are light and they're really easy to operate. And that still work, it is still work for two or three students to do, right? But if it's heavy and it's too far, oh, Please don't use watering cans, heavy watering cans from far away. You want the student, you want to make it easy for your students, or they won't do it. Then you will have to do it, and then you will be shouldering the responsibilities, which would be the first mistake that we have right up there. We don't want to do that. And number five, start annual gardens from. Don't start annual gardens from purchased plants. Do not go to Home Depot and buy plants. Why? Because first of all, plants are a lot more expensive than seeds. And most importantly, and, and, and it's easier to find organic seeds that, that, than organic plants. Home Depot will definitely not have organic plants. If they have them, maybe in a corner, looking like that, not very strong and all that. Because that's not their expertise. That's not what they care about. 
Yes. It, are the seeds that you harvest from uh, organic uh, vegetables that you brought into the class, let's say my pumpkins from last fall, and I harvest those seeds, in fact, we just harvest some now. We waited to see how long it would take before the vegetables decompose. Can you plant them? Is that the question? Yeah. You can plant well? them. Don't rely on them 100%. Okay. Uh, I would mix it with seeds that I also purchase okay. because you, you never know the viability of the seeds. With pumpkin and things like that, you actually can throw them in the, we were not going to get into technicalities, but um, uh, throw them in water and the ones that are heavy are the good ones. Those ones are the that ones sink. that sink. The ones that float, throw them out. But even the ones that are heavy and, and go to the bottom, which are relatively the best ones, you don't want to completely rely on those because okay. you never know if they're going to germinate. It's good to have that. All right, so what, what would you think if you were to write down the success criteria of your school garden, what would you put in it? Let's take two minutes. Let's let you think through that and write down what school garden do you consider successful? I'm thinking uh, just to find balance between different types of plants, strong ones for the spring, strong ones for the fall, high yield in terms of high yield, yield. okay. Yeah. I know some require more water than others. Sorry, we're in session. So if you would it's okay, thank you. Yes. Like some plants require more water than others, some hot more sun than others. So just a fine mix so that you never have what I would imagine to be like dead spots or okay. spots. So if there was so as part of your success criteria you want a good looking no, uh, you, you diverse want to sustainable as in like okay. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to plant one area that would just be like requires a lot of water and one that doesn't. Just you know, just a fine mix of them play off each other. You really do. You, are you familiar with permaculture? I if you you would you really would like would want to yeah, look into that. In urban landscape design. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. And you're a teacher now. Very different from what I studied. Yeah. But you know what? Your your students are very lucky. <laughs> Because you have that background, right? Yeah, so, so you are familiar with permaculture, um, I'm assuming. Yeah, so uh, we're not getting into technicalities, obviously, here, as I keep saying, but yeah, okay. So if you have, so as part of a success criteria, you would want a, as much as possible a self-sustaining self garden, you're saying. Okay. Yes? When you went back to, you know, what's the main purpose of a school garden? and to teach them how to grow food. I think of sort of the three main areas where they they gather some knowledge and understanding. Mm -hmm. Again, grade level appropriate. If you're at a grade one, what's a seed? What does a seed do? That kind of thing, and they understand. And then the skills to take care of the plants and understanding how to plant, and then that they would apply the processes. So that's what I, I was trying to think. Would they? How would they apply? Would they then be leaders in going the next batch and be able to read the instructions on the back of the seed packet better and understand a little bit more? So right. they would they would grow from you know the basics and be able to apply it to the next set of growing skills. Okay, so I, I'm not going to get into details of curriculuming and any of that, but I think mainly what you're uh, implying here. Um, is that you, we want the students to actually learn how to grow food in theory and practice, That's right. right? Okay, so, so since the main purpose of the school garden, we all agreed, I hope that we all agreed, is to teach students how to grow food, the part of the success criteria should be that the students actually learn how to grow food. So, right? We want to do that, and we want that in theory and practice, because if, if they only know the theory, but they don't get their hands dirty, they don't see it actually happening, they don't see the problems, they don't, you know, problem solving, initiative to problem solving, any of that will not happen, um, and they're not going to learn much. And I really think that we want empowered and inspired students. We want students to learn that working with nature is rewarding 
and we want them to learn that growing food is easy. Please don't tell your students and don't let anybody tell your students that growing food is hard. Because that is a myth, it is entirely wrong. Yes, running an urban farming facility is hard. Running a farm is hard. Because that's not just about growing food. It's about putting together, I mean, it's a business, right? And business has a lot of different aspects than just the thing that the business does. But in a small scale, like the one that you're gonna have in your school, it's not hard. So that's not true, it is not hard. You do want to pick the, the right plants and you do want to have your timing correct and yes, you do want to have the process done right. But if you do that, it's not rocket science. It really isn't rocket science. And we, we do want them. So if you grow a whole ton of food, but you and your garden looks really amazing and beautiful, but your students did not learn how to grow food and they were not empowered and inspired, your garden is a failure. I don't care how good it looks. And I don't care how many pounds of food you produced and how many people you fed. It's a school garden. It's not an urban farming facility. Um, it has to be hands-on and experiential. If it's not that, that means that they didn't learn well, and if they didn't learn, I don't care how much food you grew. Meaning that all chores has to be, and this goes back to one of the mistakes that I want you to not make. Remember the first mistake, don't shoulder the responsibilities. It has to be done by your students, and that's part of it. If your garden it's only going to be successful if, you, if your kids got their hands dirty in the soil because the experiential part of this, the authentic experiential part of this is very important. One of the YDSB and TDSB at least as, as far as I know, I don't know about all the school boards, but one of their two main focuses are health and wellness, which disconnects to phew, big time. And the second one is modern learning. And this is modern learning. I mean, it cannot get more modern learning than this, <laughs> seriously. And the experiential part of it is really important, yes? Just as an aside, I just read yesterday in the World Economic Forum that Denmark has one of the world's first schools completely dedicated to, uh, the entire school is built on a system dedicated to teaching them how to grow their own food, process it, harvest it, cook it, they have kitchens in there, the whole That's it, and you look at this school and it literally blows your mind. It's awesome. Did you know that we in TDSB there is a school that's based on um, what's it called? Um, Foodshare uh, did that, right? Bendale, yeah, Bendale School. And there's Daniel's collegiate. One of our teachers there is doing amazing. Right. So there are amazing stuff happening through this special specialized high school. Sorry. Specialized high school. Specialized high school majors. Yeah. What's the name of the school? Bendale. Uh, so that's happening right here at home, which is amazing. That's not what you will be doing, by, by the way, because that requires a lot of planning and work, and it's a different school system altogether, right? What you want to do is to incorporate this into your already running school, which is a different thing, but it's very inspiring um, to know that it's happening right here at home. Um, None of the physical work should be done by adults during school year. No matter how much food you grow, and no matter how beautiful it looks, if it was done by, the, by, by their parents, it's not a success. Okay? And it needs to be engaging and inclusive. You might be running this as an in-school program only for two of your classes, but if you put the garden right in the middle of where they play, and don't fence it out, that would be an inclusive garden, and it will be an engaging garden. You want the students to engage all of your students and their parents and the community to be engaged with the garden. That's part of their learning. You might not be teaching grade fives because you're teaching this to grade threes, but grade fives are running around the garden and they, they, they connect with the garden and they see all those beneficial insects that come and go and all the flowers and all the food and they touch it and they feel it and they learn how to behave around it and they learn that they should not be stepping on the soil or you know destroy the plant and blah 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 and all of the good stuff that comes with it. If that's not happening, it's not a success story. 
Now, what is not part of the success criteria? And that, I think that's very important. What do you think is important to know your success criteria and what is not included in it? Any suggestions? And why am I emphasizing this so much? Because at the end of the day, when you sit down to decide if you were successful or not, you want to know what you're measuring it against, right? Because people might have a lot of expectations, right? But if you're not very clear on what's the purpose and what's the success criteria and what's not in the success criteria, then at the end of the day, you might have people telling you, but I thought we were going to do this. And I thought we were going to achieve that. Why did we not do this and why did we not do that? And you don't want that. You, you want it to be very clear for you and you want it to be very clear for people who expect stuff from you. Your principal, your, your parent, parent council, whoever's putting any budget into this, you know. It, this school garden is very different than a home garden and a community garden because the stakeholders are different and the caretakers of the garden are a different age. It's totally, completely different thing. Yes? I think Mark should share a story. <laughs> When I brought up the whole topic and you say success criteria, I was like, yes, at the end, you know what I mean? The kids could um, have a little Ontario garden fair in, in the front and be able to talk about their gardens to the other students like they do in every other class. Right, engagement, right? <laughs> and my baby goes, oh, and they can make salsa. That could be a real good success. So when you said success criteria, and I looked at it and I go, Oh, well, if we don't make salsa, we didn't succeed. <laughs> then we're not successful. <laughs> not the garden. Was we can make salsa. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Where did we get? <laughs> I get that a lot. When I when I bring my program to schools, I I'm very clear to the principal and VP and whoever and pan council that I'm not a cooking program. I'm a growing program, and I would love for them to go and find somebody else that does a cooking program and connect that to my garden. That would be amazing, that would be awesome, but that is a separate project. Mm -hmm. So be very clear on what is it, it is that you're doing. Awesome. Day. So she said whatever, and I said yeah, you can come and talk to the kids and, and go through and pick. Right. <laughs> Even if it's just one pick and you only can get three, three tomatoes. Right. So I go, but you can come in and you can be one of Amazing, our, um, amazing wholesalers that are looking at, at our produce and can give us feedback. Right. One of the things that, that, that makes teachers burn out is the scope is this much at the beginning, that's what you think you're doing, and then all of a sudden the sp scope becomes this. Right? Don't let that happen to you. So uh, I don't care how much food you grew, period. Doesn't matter. Did you feed the whole community? I don't care. Who cares? Doesn't matter. Did the students learn how to grow food? Yes. Then you're successful. It doesn't matter if everything grew perfectly well. In my school gardens, after so many years, with the process that's in place and everything, does everything grow perfectly well? No. It's nature. No. And it's a school garden. Things get abused and, you know, some of them don't, you know, it's seed pack that we bought might not be as strong or whatever, right? There are many, many different things. As long as you grew some plants and you better choose the ones that are easy to grow and fast and, and all of that. Again, I'm not going to get into technicalities, but as long as this, your students were empowered and inspired and they learned that growing food is easy, because for that you do need some success, you're successful. But it doesn't matter if you had problems. It doesn't matter if you had pest and disease and vandalism. Because you know what, if you had none of that at all, there's only very limited stuff that your students learned. Because when vandalism happened, then you have to deal with that. When there's pests and then there's disease, it's a, it's a, it's a learning tool. And we want them to learn that working with nature means that nature is going to give us feedback. And we have to accept that not as a failure, but as a feedback. And then that will spark ideas of research and, you know, initiative to problem solving. 
which is part of what you want to teach them as, as growing food, because that's part of growing food, um, to learn how to work with nature. Actually consider yourself lucky if you get some of that stuff, because that, that, that's an opportunity in a school. It is not an opportunity in a farming business. <laughs> Probably they, they don't like to see any of that. But in a school, you can turn anything into an opportunity to teach your students something. Right? Um, if all other teachers started teaching in the garden, I've seen this, oh my god, I had this wonderful, wonderful gentleman. He built a huge garden and he had so much to go through because it was a huge garden and so uh, going through the school board and all that so many hurdles so many uh, roadblocks and he went through all of that he grew a lot of food with his students and a lot of them were involved and they learned how to grow food and all of that and at the end of the day he was completely disappointed because he said I wanted to prove to the other teachers and this was a high school that they can teach in the garden. And 80, 80 teachers in this school, none of them moved their foot forward to say, yes, we saw your amazing success, and now we want to teach math in the garden, and we want to teach physics in the garden, and we want to teach biology in the garden. None of them did, and he was completely disappointed. In my opinion, that didn't matter. It should not have been in the success criteria in the first place. So don't put stuff in there that depends on other people. You can only control your own actions and your own behaviors. And you can never control. For some teachers, unfortunately, this is just a job. They don't want to move their foot forward into, you know, outside of their comfort zone. They just want to just continue doing whatever they've been doing um, for years and years and years. Right? Or maybe they're new to the school and it's already too much for them, right? Or it's at the beginning of their career or whatever, whatever. You, you never know what people are going through. So be kind, be generous, be understanding, and don't expect anything from anybody. Don't expect anything from your caretakers, don't expect it from parent community, don't just assume that nobody's going to help you and then you'll be happy when they do because some people will. Some teachers will go to the garden and some people, teachers will come to you and say, thank you for this garden, it looks amazing and beautiful, blah, blah, blah. But not everybody does. So that is not part of the success criteria and it does not matter if it was cheaper than the super, supermarket and it doesn't matter if, uh, if we made money or not. It's awesome if you can add on top of that an entrepreneurial project, especially in high schools, but that is a separate project which has its own scope and its own budget and own everything, right? Don't let the scope to become so big that you cannot actually handle, okay? Any questions? Anything you think should be in the criteria? Are we missing anything? Anybody expecting you anything that you think shouldn't be there? Are we good? Can we move on? All right. Okay, so why, why am I gonna tell you these myths? Because you're gonna hear them if you already haven't heard them. And I don't want you to feel alone. You're not the only one hearing these, okay? Um, gardens are expensive. I have built school gardens with zero dollars. I'm not saying that's your situation. I'm not saying that's exactly what's gonna happen with you. This was a YRDSP school. We went in the ground and they were very resourceful. So one of the parents knew somebody who could donate um, you know, free soil and one of the parents who knew somebody who could donate uh, free mulch and then um, my programs are not inexpensive. But the garden itself, the physical garden itself, zero dollars. Again, I'm not saying that's your scenario, but don't just assume, just because everybody says, oh, let's think about the budget. The first thing they, they want to think about is the budget. But do you actually know how much it's gonna cost you? Maybe it costs you nothing, right? So don't assume that, it's a myth. Uh, school gardens will get attacked, vandalized, and animals will eat, destroy, or contaminate all the food. Oh my God, 
so many fears, right? And after you actually do it, and it, none of that stuff happens, or a little bit of it happens, and it gets, you know, resolved very quickly, they're like, huh, and then the garden starts growing, and they're like, huh, you know? So you're gonna hear this, this stuff. Just tell them it's a myth. I've seen success stories, and one of the problems is not there aren't that many success stories, right? But that's why I was sharing with you those pictures so that you know that this can happen. It, it's, it can be successful. Okay? Um, school gardens are a lot of work for teachers. Yes, they will be if the teachers shoulder the responsibilities, but it doesn't have to be. Okay? You still do need to plan, you still need, do need to write a curriculum that connects to the Ontario curriculum so that you can do it in, in school and all of that, but the actual work shouldn't be done by you anyway. Um, I need to be an expert gardener to do this. No, I'm so happy. Is, is anybody an expert gardener here? I used to. Awesome. <laughs> Your students are, are, are lucky. Most people aren't though, right? And that's okay and thank you for being here. You don't need to be an expert gardener. Okay, you, you're a teacher. and That's what you're, you're going to be doing in the garden as well. Uh, school gardens need a lot of time. That's another myth. It all depends on how you do it. It all depends on your planning and it depends on your curriculum and all of that. It is not necessarily the case. It's a myth. Um, growing food is hard work. We already talked about that. Please don't say that because that's not true. It's not true at all. Um, okay. Any questions? Maybe we can, um, before we go, before I talk about that, so let's go back so I don't distract you with that. Um, yes? I don't know if you can answer this because I don't think it goes into te technicalities, but what about the winter time in, in a zone? I don't teach. Nothing happens in the winter? No. Okay. Not, not, but like I don't have a program for winter. Okay. The reason is that most schools don't have the facilities that is required for growing indoors. Uh, and those facilities are usually expensive. If you're lucky and you have a hydroponic system that's in, indoors, then awesome. But most schools don't, so I don't do it. Yeah. But there are growing that you can do mm -hmm. indoors. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what is a bright line rule? A bright line rule is a clearly defined rule or standard composed of objective factors which leaves little or no room for varying interpretations. I think originally it came from military, I'm not sure entirely, but they, they use bright lines in um, helping alcoholics get through their problems. And bright lines essentially are things that you just follow no matter what. Right? Like they tell alcoholics that they should never, ever, under any circumstances, social, not, doesn't matter. What happened today doesn't matter. You do not sit, take even one sip of alcohol of any type, of any percentage, whatever. Done. It's a bright line. Right? So it actually, the purpose of a bright line rule is to produce predictable and consistent results in its application. So essentially it helps, it's very helpful to have bright lines because um, in those situations 100% is a lot easier than 99%. Because if you want to follow a rule 99% of the time, then every time that you want to follow that rule you have to think through it. What is the circumstance? Should I do it? Should I not do it? You know, That's a lot of energy and thinking and planning and all of that that you have to go through. But if you're like, this is it, I'm never going to do this or this is it, I'm always going to do this, then it's 100% of the time easy. You don't need to think about it, you don't need to worry about it ever, right? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to give you six school gardening bright lines that I personally think, believe, and that's through the research that I've done and the experience that I have had in the schools that I think you should follow. And a lot of it you've already heard through the mistakes and you know myths and this and that. But I want to be very clear because bright lines are supposed to be very clear. Okay, so let's go through those. So number one, we already talked about this. All work should be done by your students, even building the garden if possible. 
again, I said it's a bright line, but I say if possible, right? Um, for example, if you're in a high school and you're thinking about building something, find a way for your students to do it, okay? My, my students in my school gardens, if it is not a planter that's already installed there, like a raised bed that's already installed there, they build their garden. And even if, if you have a planter, regen regenerating the soil to get it ready to, it's all done by the students. No adult ever touches my school gardens. And I'm serious about that. Bright line, 100% of the time. Uh, part of an in-school program, ran by teachers. Bright line. Don't do it as an uh, eco club or uh, like get them involved, right? With the watering and with the harvesting and with all of that. I'm not saying dismantle your eco club or your, if you have a garden club, that's awesome, right? But this needs to be taught to your students in a structured manner because growing a garden requires structure. You do a bunch of stuff at the beginning of the season. When it's the middle of the season, there's other stuff that you need to do. You need to make sure that your seeds are started at the right time, otherwise it's going to be too late or too early and then, you know. So you need a schedule. So book your in-school program. Let everybody know that you're doing gardening day three at this time or Mondays at that time. And you show them the connections it has to your curriculum and why you're doing that and all of that because they're going to ask you for that anyway, right? But let everybody know and let parents know too. We're doing this because it connects to this and that and that, but it's a gardening program and it happens every week at the same time. Okay? Let everybody take you seriously and your students take you seriously and you take you seriously because you schedule something, you said oh, I'm going to do it, it's going to be helpful to you to actually follow through with it and do it, okay? Number three, place the garden in sight, we talked about that, and make it accessible, okay? I don't know what that sound is, but I hope it's, not, it's nothing horrible. Uh, we've survived so far. Uh, and make it accessible. Put it where the students are. If you want to put the students where the garden is, you're going to have to put effort into doing that. But if you already put the garden where they already are, then all the, all the interactions that you want to happen will automatically naturally happen. Right? It makes your life a lot easier. And all the work too. Number four, start all annual from seed. Don't purchase plants because they're more expensive and your students are going to miss out on a whole a very important part of growing food, which is seeds and seed germination and trans and, and um, taking care of transplants and uh, hardening them off, getting them used to the outside world and all of the stuff that they need to learn before they actually put the plant in the garden. Okay? Because the main purpose is teaching them how to grow food and if you purchase plants and put it in the garden, what did they learn really? Growing food starts with seeds. Yes? This might be a but when would you suggest starting the spring garden that you're hoping to? My program starts at the beginning of April. It's a 10 week program and 10 weeks is a good time for growing a garden. And you do want to give yourself a little bit of time at the end of the school year because you don't want to be, you know, trying to get stuff done when uh, half of the kids aren't there and uh, they're on vacation. And you want to give yourself a little bit of lead time as well, right, at the, at the end of the school year. So a April, beginning of April start, start it so that you have a good 10 weeks with ease. And if things happen and you're not there, you get sick, you know, things like that happen too. The pre, like sprouting the seeds that you have. You can you can grow? do some of that. So if you go there and you get your planting schedule, that's going to be very helpful. Mm -hmm. uh, there are some plants that here in Ontario you can start earlier than beginning of April, but most of them beginning of April is a good time to start. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Number five. Do your DCP before assuming the expenses. The, f the first thing people say, all oh, school gardens are expensive, so wh where are we going to get the budget from? What budget? How much do you need? 
Do you actually know how much you need? Maybe you don't need to purchase anything. Maybe you're resourceful and you can find out, you know, ways to get stuff donated to you and all of that, right? So do your design. Know if you need raised beds or not, or do you have a spot that you can put that gets enough sunlight? Do you need things on wheels? Do you like what is it? What is your design, right? Then write your curriculum, the one that's connected with the with the with the Ontario curriculum that you're gonna do indoor in, in school. And then that will tell you how much you're gonna need to spend on the material that you're gonna buy. Like you need seed starters and you need seeds and you need you know soil that goes into the cups, blah blah blah. That will give you an idea, a ballpark idea of how much you're gonna need and the planning. If you haven't done those three, don't jump into a conclusion that you need to apply for a grant. You might not need to apply for a grant. Yes. Um, I just want to share that iPark has like a plant giving program or something. I don't know all about it yet, but I heard from the school that I'm going to be working with that they are able to get probably all the plants that I need or want. Um, they have like a huge order list that they can put in, and then High Park like provides them. I don't know if it's seeds or if it's like plants. But uh, if they are perennial plants, go for it. That's awesome. It, uh, you see, okay, let's go back. You see I say annual plants? Because that's the growing food part of it. Like if you're, if you're putting in f flowers, for example, that help uh, attract pollinators for your uh, vegetable garden, that's awesome. So, because perennial plants are not easy to grow from seed in a, in a school environment. But annual plants are, and that's what you want. Don't, so I wouldn't order any plants that are annual plants. I would only or, order things that are perennial that would help your school garden. Okay. Um, okay, so we talked about that. So don't jump into a conclusion and start small. You probably will do that, but I've seen schools that went full blown. And then I, I, I mentioned it actually very quickly before that they, they kept hitting roadblocks after roadblocks after roadblock because it was like I don't know how many like a million planters and they wanted to dig a well and it was just like so much headache that they had to go through to get it approved by their board. Um, do we have anybody from mm -hmm. a private school here? I should have asked from the beginning. Okay, awesome. You, you don't have that many issues. Yeah, so board of directors says go for it, and then you're gone. Yeah, but, but if you're in a school board, it's a, uh, a public school, definitely start small. You start small too, because starting small, why do we want to start small? Because that, this is a permaculture principle actually. Use slow and small solutions is one of the principles. Because if you go big, and if you want it fast, your possible quote-unquote failures were going to come at you bigger and faster. You want to start small and then build on your success because the smaller it is, not, not too small, like don't start with two tomato plants because the chances of your students harvesting any food out of those two tomato plants is just so slim and it's so disappointing and outside of attention span of kids any age. Okay, That's way too small. But don't go and, you know, install 100 mm, raised beds, okay? Because, oh my God, uh, first of all, you're gonna have a lot to handle, then, then you're gonna have to shoulder a lot of the responsibilities, especially if it's your first time, start small. Um, I would go not bigger than 24 square feet, okay? For the first garden, really and start with maybe two classes. If you're only starting with your own class, even 24 square feet might be too much for you. Okay, maybe half of that. Uh, but don't go a lot smaller than that because you do want diversity in your garden. And you do want to have, if, if something doesn't work out, you do want to have other things that are working out, you know? So you do want a little bit of a like don't don't start with only one thing and very little uh, amounts. Even the even the seed pack, like lettuce seed pack, let's say that ha that says 98% germination on the package, it still has 
like nine, let's say 90% germination on the package because that, that would be a very high germination actually. That means that out of 100 seeds, 10 seeds will not grow. That's just the way it is. Now if you only grow 10 seeds, you might end up with those 10 seeds <laughs> that were not supposed to grow in the first place. But if you grow 100, then you'll get a good result. You know, so plant plenty and a few varieties, but don't go so big that you can't handle it. And everybody gets scared and they, they try to stop you. Um, okay, so if you don't make those mistakes and you, if you follow these bright lines, you will be well on your way to a successful and sustainable school garden. We'll, we will talk about sustainability too. Ah. Okay, any questions? Are we good? Are we tired? Was it too much? We're good? Okay. I hope I'm not boring you. At least nobody's sleep yet. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess that's a good sign. All right. Okay. So sustainability is one of those words that has a lot of different, like different people define it differently. I have a very specific like I'm not talking about environmental sustainability when it comes to school garden. I'm talking specifically about success continuity. Okay, so you did all that, you followed all those bright lines and you made none of those mistakes, you wrote your curriculum, you connected it to the school garden, to the Ontario curriculum, you convinced people and you went ahead as an in-school program, you taught your students, you went through all of that work and you got to a huge success. Your students learned how to grow food. What a wonderful thing you have there. How do you make sure that it's going to continue happening year after year after year, effortlessly, no matter if you're going to be there or not, no matter if the parents' community, the same, like the turnover should not matter, okay? That is one of the biggest hurdles that we have those enthusiastic awesome teachers who shoulder all those responsibilities move on they go to another school and that's it right we have we have a situation here right yeah 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 so that happens teachers move around you might move around and all the, that knowledge you're taking with you good for the next school you're going to but what about the school you're leaving behind Right? Maybe you, you move on and you, you know, go higher level, maybe you become a VP and a principal and then you, know, you can't do that anymore. So you need to ha make sure that it continues um, after you leave. For that you need a system. You need a system that works with clear components, bright lines and guidelines. Okay? So, and the system that I have put together is this, which has three components, design, curriculum, and planning. I told you about it before. These are the components the system has. I told you about the bright lines, all of the bright lines, you have them. And it does have guidelines, and I'm going to share one of the most important guidelines with you, which is related to sustainability, and that's documentation. Documentation, documentation, documentation. You need to document everything you do so that the next person can continue what you did, okay? Um, I come from an abundance mentality. I told you the story behind that. And I really, I really strongly believe in sharing. And I strongly believe in teaching other people. You are all teachers, right? So if you write a curriculum, right, that you use, and when you go somewhere else, you're gonna be using in your new school, share that. Be generous and come from an abundant mentality and share that with the teachers who are going to be continuing the work that you did. That's what I suggest. That's, that's how I think that, the, that, the, that we can move forward and change the world to a better place. Okay? So, and document everything else too. Like why did you choose the design that you chose? If you have somebody coming in 
uh, like eco schools that that like, or evergreen that comes in and you will have that part of the documentation which is awesome but if that's not the case document it why did I choose this space because this it gets this many hours of sunlight and it's close to the water and how did it, what processes did you put in place did you have to coordinate with the caretakers in order for the students to be able to go and what is it they go and get the key and then the hose and then they who's gonna you know connect the hose for them and you know every detail like that that matters document it um, if you don't then you know how it is and if you know that you're going to be in that school for a very long time maybe the pressure is not too high for you right now at the moment to do it but if you are thinking about moving on and if you're thinking about you know going to mat leave or moving to another school or going up the ladder you know and become become a VP or anything like that make sure that you document your work so that people can continue does that make sense okay great all right, so I'm going to, and I know you, some of you already expressed that. You, you want to know how I can help you. I'm going to tell you about that. Like, what, it is, what is it that I do, and how can you bring my programs to your school, and all of that. But before we get into that, um, any questions about anything that we discussed so far? Yes? I know this is maybe kind of out there, but. Are there any kind of like templates or like planning templates that already exist so we don't have to reinvent the wheel? That's part, of, that's there. That's there. Thank you. Yeah, you'll get the, it gives you a schedule that looks something like this. And use the trial period if you don't want to pay for it, <laughs> right? Um, you go in there and you don't even have to design anything. You just drag and drop the plants you know you want to grow, okay, into the design, and there's no need for a design. They have a design tool. You can actually design the thing, and for a high school, that, that's awesome. They, they, they do have teacher uh, classroom subscriptions, I think. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't needed it, so I didn't um, go through that. But anyway, drag and drop in everything you want to grow, and then there's another tab that gives you your planting schedule. The planting schedule is color-coded, uh, there's blue, green, and yellow, orange, <laughs> anyway, three colors. One color tells you when is a good time in your, in, because when you register, you tell them where you are in the world, and they adjust the planting schedule to, it's not 100% accurate, because there's something called microclimates, so even here, um, like even in this building, if I grow something on this side of the building, it's not going to grow the same as the other side of the building, even if they ha it has the exact same amount of sunlight, right? But, so th it's not going to be that accurate, like 100% accurate, but it's a very, very good high-level guideline, right? So it tells you when you can start seeds indoors, which is the blue line, when you can transplant them outside or sow them directly outside, and when you can expect to harvest. And when you can expect to harvest is very important for a school environment because you don't want to have to harvest things in summertime when you're not around. Okay, so yeah, that's going to be very helpful. Or are there any plants that will be sustained over the summer so that there'll be some produce in September? Right. I know when we did potatoes, when we went in September under yep. the earth, they were still pulling out potatoes. Yes, so you want short maturing seeds that will give you a good harvest before the students leave for summer and you want longer maturing plants so that the students come back to food in September, right? You don't want, for the plant community, you only want them to water and that's it. You don't want them to have to harvest and have to take care of the mess and you don't want things growing there that will fall on the floor and create a mess and any of that. So you want to eliminate by, by making sure that you do a good plan and picking your seeds well and your timing well, you want to make sure that you don't, you don't expect anybody to do anything other than watering during summertime. Okay? Thank you. yeah, you're welcome. Anything else? Okay, so let me tell you a little bit wha about what you can do with the information that you gathered here today. One way is to go DIY 
and I encourage you to do that. Do it yourself. This is what you learned here at a very high level, which is going to put you ahead of a lot of other people who don't have this information, right? We talked about the myths. We talked about the purpose of a school garden, success criteria, what is sustainability, how do we get to sustainability, mistakes to avoid, and the six bright lines to follow. Now, when you take this information and you want to do it yourself, you do need to do these. Please stick to what you learned here. Well, I guess that's a given. Um, you, you still need to write your lesson plans for those 10 weeks of programming. You need to you know, connect it to the Ontario curriculum, make sure that you get the buy-in. And it's, if it's not connected, obviously nobody's gonna buy in. Um, and you need to actually schedule that as part of the planning, right? Schedule that as, as I told you, like this is when I'm gonna do it for 10 weeks. Everybody know, please support me, right? Um, and you do want to design a garden if you have, you know, awesome people who can come in and help you with that. That's awesome. That's already out of your way. Um, plan for execution. And there's going to be a little bit of a trial and error because this is going to be probably the first time that you're doing it. And that's okay. But know that knowing all that, this is still something that you need to do. So you do need to put in the planning for you know, this is what I need to do, this is the time that I need to be released or whatever it is um, for me to do the work. So, Kids Growing City in School Programs is a program that I run in, in, in schools. It's a 10 week, one hour per week per class program. It's minimum of two classes and four, four school classes have priority because if you give me the whole day, that means my teachers don't have to move from school to school in one day and that makes my life and their lives a lot easier so I would really prefer it but if if that's not the case then two three is still okay and although it's more money for me but but I prefer two because then I can schedule two schools in the same day like I can serve your school in the morning and then my teachers can move on to another school in the afternoon. Um, usually more than four periods in a day, it's too much. If you do have five periods in a day and there are, are really five classes and five teachers that are really excited about this, we can still like, accommodate that, but we can, we can talk about that. Usually four is the maximum that people can handle. Um, we bring and run our lesson plan, so there's no lesson plan writing for you, no planning, nothing, so it's all done by us. And we guide you with your design, right? If you, already, if you already have that and you don't need it, that's awesome. But we will tell you where not to put your garden, where do, put, to put your garden. If you already have a garden, hmm, do we need to move it or for what reason and all of that. And we do all the planning and we guarantee results. Okay, now we also train your teachers. And the reason I put guarantee results before training your teachers because that's not, I don't guarantee that. I do everything in my power to train your teachers, but it's really up to them, right? It's up to you guys. How much you pay attention, how much of it do you believe in. Um, how much time you're willing to put into actually understanding the concepts and you know uh, documenting uh, what I'm teaching you but what happens is that my teachers you shadow them you learn from shadowing you can ask any questions from them um, like the reasons behind it how it connects to the curriculum and all of that you can uh, you will have access to my online courses for free so essentially you will have everything you need so that you can learn, so that you, your school doesn't have to hire me the next year. Because that's part of the sustainability. I would like to go to more and more schools. I, it's okay if you want me to come back, it's okay, I'll come back. Like it's not, I'm not gonna say no, especially to a school that I've already worked with. Um, but I would very much prefer to go to, to spread this more into more schools and touch more lives. Essentially, that's the purpose. Um, and for the sustainability of this in your school, it's important that you learn. Um, because one year the budget is there and you can hire me, the next year the budget might not be there. And then what happens? 
because that has happened to me. And it's so sad to see that nobody can continue that work that has been done in the school. Okay, so I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about this thing. <laughs> so I developed this online course for teachers, teaching them exactly how, what I do, right? As part of my master's degree program here in environmental studies, as I told you before. Uh, so my profs really loved it. And they were like, yes, this is exactly what we need. And let's get teachers you know, um, enrolled in it and all that. And then I got 15 teachers enrolled in it uh, as like a beta version, as, as the founding members of, of it, into it. Those, are the, those were the teachers from the schools that I had already worked with. Um, and then none of them went, like not even one of them went through the whole course. Because in my online platform, I can see that who, you know, the progress of my students, right? And then I kept asking them, how's the course? Yes, it's awesome, it's fabulous, it's amazing. We love it, we love it, we love it. And I go and look at their progress. They're not even watching the videos. And then I go back and like, please tell me, why are you not watching? Oh, I don't do that. Right? No. So it's really interesting. When you do social related work, people love what you do and they're very hesitant about giving you critical criticism because they think that you're going to get discouraged and then you're not going to continue and, they, 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 and that's, that's the downside of something like this. If it was like, um, I don't know, if, if I was making video games then people would be really brutal about telling me what's not working and why, right? But if you're building a school garden, nobody tells you what you're doing wrong, which is which is, anyway, anyway, that, that was my experience at least with this. So I had to actually grab them and sit them down. Why are you not, but I love what you're doing and I don't want you to get discouraged. And I'm like, no, please, I won't get discouraged. I'm dedicating my life to this. Please tell me, I need to know so that I can improve it, right? And what do you think was the answer? No time. And I'm like, Ugh. like my system that I'm teaching in that course the main focus of it is based on the fact that the teachers don't have time. So let's make it really efficient for them. Let's make sure that the students do all the work. Let's make sure this and let's make sure that. And then I go out and have a course that, that, is, that is like 20 hours of video. And I expect teachers to do it on their own time. Well, guess what? That failed big time. Right? But I did have programs that were working in terms of teacher training. So the shadowing program in my schools were work was working very well because those teachers were very much involved and they were, they were, and that could have been part of why they didn't go through the online course because these were the teachers who were already shadowing me and learning from me. So maybe they didn't have all the uh, reasons to go to the online course because they had me in other ways. but. But I think it was also the time, I mean, and that was a big thing. Um, and I also had in-person workshops like this one, w in which we run for the teachers and we actually go into the technicalities. And I also had uh, short online workshops, and short online workshops also work very well. Teachers um, like very much to be in, like, um, webinars, for example, work very, very well with teachers. So what I did is that I put these two that we're actually working together and this year I'm offering a boot camp for teachers. Um, so, so this is the third option. The first one was the DIY. The second one is to bring my program into your school. The third one is to register for the boot camp. So the way the boot camp is going to work is that it's going to be total 12 weeks. So we start two weeks before the 10 weeks of doing it in your school. And two weeks of it is going to be the basics, and mistakes, and bright lines, design, etc., etc. And actually, the, the second week you will get your third week's lesson plan, like my lesson plan, my career curriculum. Um, and then you'll get your shopping list. You'll be shown exactly how to run that one lesson plan, not the whole thing, not the whole. Um, uh, program. Just that one lesson plan, like very focused, right? And then you go. And at the end of the week, you come to a coaching call with me. So that's another webinar. 
So at the beginning of the week, I show you what to do it, give you the lesson plan, give you the shopping list, we go. At the end of the week, you come and you ask your questions. This is the hurdle that I'm having. This is the problem that I can't solve. This is whatever, whatever. Or I had really success with this or with that, right? And then we continue doing that boom, 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 boom for 10 weeks. It will be like my teacher's coming to your school and running it for you, but it'll be better. It will take a little bit of your time, obviously, because, but it'll be better because you'll be involved from the very beginning with this. And your learning is going to be kind of like the shadowing program, right? And you don't need to go and watch apparently boring videos, <laughs> like 20 hours of boring videos to, to learn this. So I'm like, this is, I have not run this before. This is the first time I'm doing it. And because of that, the, the price is going to be a lot lower than next year's because I, it essentially will be co-creating this together because I'm, I'm making it up as I go. Yes, I do have the curriculum that, that's proven and it works and all of that. And that's what I will be giving you. But I'm sure that I'm going to be learning a lot from, from you as well while we're going through this together. And if I haven't confused you and given you too much information already enough, um, I'm thinking also about a hybrid between the two, meaning that I, my teachers will come and set you up for two weeks. So they will run the two beginning weeks. So we will build your garden with your students and we will show you how to do the seeding, the starting the seeds indoors, and then you will continue in the online boot camp program to the end of the thing. Okay? That's for the ones that, the, the ones that don't have the budget for the whole uh, in-school program, but don't want to go like all, all on their own in the boot camp because they're like, I need a boost at the beginning. I need it to be set up for me and then I can continue it, right? But if I were to set it up, maybe I don't know, maybe I can't do it, right? So, which is understandable and this is a hybrid of those two. Okay, any questions about how any of these run? Do you have a pamphlet with the price? The, I have the next slide is pricing, so I'll give you the pricing, yeah. But any questions in terms of how the programs run? Where are you thinking of locating the Where? Uh, it's going to be webinars. Okay. It's online. So you come to a call, which I teach you about that lesson plan, and at the end of the week you come to another call, a, a webinar call, face-to-face, in which you will ask your questions and I am going to be limiting this to I'm thinking 10, 10 um, at the most this year because this is the first time I'm doing it it's going to take a lot of energy and thinking and all of that out of me and if I have a lot of people in there I may not be able to I, I would like to do it like a one-on-one -on -one type coaching I don't want a million people in there because I want you to get the get the get the best of me yes so in terms of timelines, mm -hmm. when would the two weeks commence around what time of the year? Beginning of April. So it'll be like all the pro all my programs beginning of April. So let's make it because mm -hmm. so it would June. end like mid-June, something like that? That's what we want to end up because you don't want to go all the way to the end. No. Yeah. Are you thinking even earlier? Oh, well, I'm actually, I'm actually, my little mind has been working. I'm doing it, I'm doing my TPA this year, and I've been ruminating about what to base it on. So I could combine learning this program with preparing my TPA. Oh, that would be awesome. So it would be yeah. a really good learning opportunity for me. Awesome, I'm happy to hear that. I actually have a present, 10 minutes only, presentation for the OCT, March 1st. I'm trying to see if I can convince them to put this as a as a additional qualification course. Wow. So there's nothing it's just a 10 minute presentation. Well, I don't know if it's going to go through or not and even if it does then I have to write the whole course which is not just the boot camp or this online course it's like a complete 125 hours of yeah. So which would be awesome. Like that would be my dream come true. Well, that wouldn't happen this year. Oh, oh no. Okay. Not even next year, yeah, okay. because that's going to take, I mean, I don't think it would. 
because the process sounds really <laughs> too long. Lots of steps. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yes. For schools that already have gardens in place, um, because the I guess the boot camp begins right, it, it gives it gives you you know right when you start, mm -hmm. and like as a tag, nothing. So for schools that already have gardens going, um, how relevant is that? You still want to re revitalize your garden though, right? Even if you're not, yeah. So there's still um, stuff that you need to do. You still need to purchase or, or you know, acquire somehow um, compost. Um, you might want to do some, you know, weeding. You might want to do some sheet. There, there might be stuff that you still need to do. So you, you got to be there from the very beginning, even if you do have oh, a school. Sure. Yeah. 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 So this, would, this course would address things like um, um, preparing soil, uh, fertilizing, everything yes. related to it. Okay. Yes. Everything you need to know to build a successful and sustainable school garden. <laughs> okay, any more questions? All right, so let's talk about pricing, which is a question we had. Okay. The number one, the DIY one, I obviously I can't give you a price that's not, it's completely out of my hand, but I warn you, please, 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 don't think that it's going to cost you zero dollars. Okay, don't, do not make that mistake. You're gonna see a bunch of big numbers here. Because as I kept saying, my programs are not cheap, okay? But don't assume that if you do it on your own, it's going to be zero dollars because you still need to write that curriculum and you need, still need to be released to do that. And that's expense, at least that the first thing that comes to my mind. And depending on what you do and what your design is, it can be zero dollars or it can be thousands of dollars. I don't really know how much that's going to be, okay? So it's just, I want to mention that because that's a mistake people do make. And like, I'm gonna do it on my own, it's gonna cost me nothing. That's not really true. So, for four classes, which is 40 hours of programming and four teachers that will shadow us and learn and get access to the boot camp as well as the online course, that's the number, $4,900. I have teachers that come to your school, you get one teacher and one teacher assistant and my teachers are paid well, okay? That's very, very important to me. If it's three classes, 30 hours of programming, three teachers that will be shadowing us and learning from us and have access to the boot camp as well as the online course, that's 39.50. If it's two classes, means 20 hours of programming, that, which is two teachers that shadow us and get access to the online course and online courses come with certificate as well. That's 29.75. And again, it include, includes online access to boot camp, and online courses for teachers, depending on how many hours in a week you give us, like how many classes you give us. Like if you give us four classes, obviously there will be four teachers, and they all get access to it. If it's three, it's three. If it's two, it's two. Okay? I just, we were just figuring out, it's actually, when we think about women scientists in school, or that they're between 150 to 200 per class. So, when you break it down that way, because a principal will be shocked at those numbers. Right, but it's but actually, you say yeah. How many hours you're getting. Um, yeah. And all the benefits that comes with it, all the shadowing and boot camp and learning and all of that. Thank you. Thank you for saying that, because yes, that's usually the case. But when you compare it with other programs, this is. I can't come, I will not do it. Like I will not come one time to your school and do a willy-nilly job of doing one hour of one something. This is growing food. It needs a plan and it needs weeks for it to actually get to work, right? I've done those types of things, like in community centers and here and there. I have run, ran those types of things and I have discontinued all of that and I'm focusing on what works. This actually will work. Because if you do want a sustainable and successful school garden, you do have to do all those things in those 10 weeks. Um, so yeah, thank you for mentioning that. It is, actually, it's not that expensive, right? But it is a ballpark number that you have to swallow. Okay, 
So, um, so that's the number for the boot camp. And this is this year only. And the reason for that is that, again, as I said, we're co-creating this together. I'm not going to pretend that I am an expert in this. This is the first time that I'm running something like that, that online with, with so many workshops and all of that. Um, but next year, it's going to be higher. And if we can make it an OCT, then, then who knows? Right? But, <laughs> but anyway, this is, this is where we are right now at this point in time. And if at the same school, if there is another teacher, like honestly, I think you should share the information. Um, but if, if there is a second teacher who, and, and that's totally fine with me, like share the information about whatever you learn in this boot camp with the whole school. The more we have, the better, right? Um, but if there is another teacher who does want to have a separate access and get a separate certificate for her or for him separately, then that's the price for that, okay? For a second or third or fourth teacher. And the hybrid would be two in-school sessions. This is also brand new this year because the boot camp is brand new this year. So um, we're, we're winging it as we go essentially this year. And that's why it's going to be cheaper. It's two in-school sessions for two classes, online access to bootcamp for two teachers. That's the price for it. And that's the price for any second or third or, you know, same thing, essentially. So that's to answer that question. What time is it? We have 15 minutes. Not too bad, actually. I did, I did, boom, 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 did that. I'm sorry, so I know you got tired. But I wanted to let you go at 12. Yes? Like, is there like, pamphlets or something that we can walk over? So you will have access to this presentation. Right after this, um, I have all your email addresses. And if your, if your email address is not on this because somebody else registered you, Please make sure you put down your email address so that I can send you um, the information. Some of you, most of you actually were early bird registrants. For early bird registrants, there's two bonuses. So I need to send you the information about the, the coupon and the, um, and the links, uh, as well as a link to this presentation. So you will have all of this. You can actually, it's a link that you can actually walk people through if you want to give them a presentation <laughs> too. It's like, and all that information is there. So I'll be sending you that, okay? Um, so for number two and four, which is the hybrid and the in-school program, uh, we need a consultation, okay? I, I need to come to your school, we need to talk about it, we need to talk to your principal, we need to, because they need to schedule that into your in-school program. And they need to know that you're doing this so, so that they give you the credit and it's just, you know, it's not like we can, come in and run a 10-week program in your school without having a talk with somebody that's, right? So that's why, so up until yesterday, I actually had a consultation yesterday in a TDSP school, which was a free, uh, like I do free consultations uh, throughout the year, but, that, but yesterday was the last day that I would do that because we're getting really close to April. Uh, therefore, I really want to consult only with those schools that are serious about this. And that's why I need the deposit. And it's just a deposit, it'll go, right? And if I come to your consultation and we decide that I'm a good person, I'm not gonna steal your $100, trust me. If you decide that this is not a good fit, I'll give you back the $100, okay? But I want you to know that you're serious because it is really getting close. And we only do the consult these consult consultations before end of February, because March is the month that we will do the scheduling with the schools that I already, already had set and had hired us, because it's a lot to do, because a lot of schools are on a day system, right? And we, do, we don't do the day system, by the way. Like, it's a day of the week that you give me, right? So I come every Tuesday from this time to this time. So there's a scheduling, as you can imagine, that you have to make sure to do if you have four classes. So there are stuff that you need to go through throughout March. That's why I don't do any more consultations. Like I only do that during March. And at the beginning of April, the program starts. Okay, so I want you to know the deadlines so that. And, oh, okay, by the way, 
This is also another place that you can find this information. So if you go to kidsgrowingcity.ca slash programs, all the pricing and everything is there for those th three options that you have. And there's a button behind, um, in below number two and four, which, which takes you to an online um, booking thing <laughs> that you can pay the $100 and you can book um, um, up until end of February, I have Mondays and Fridays free, and that's all I do in those two days. I do I do school consultations, okay? And you can actually get that done for you, lovely people, because you came here for your schools. There's a five percent discount, and if your parent cancel fundraises, they keep twenty percent of it. So if you think, this is a fundraising, it's not a discount. Okay, so the first one is a discount. So right off the bat, you get 5% five, 5 discount. But whatever that number would be for you, depending on which program you choose, then you pay the price, you pay that, and if your school council actually raised that money, 20% of whatever they raised, whatever portion they raised, 20% of that goes to the council. Okay, so it's a fundraising, not at discount. Is that clear? Uh, the reason I do this is that that would be very helpful. If, if you can get them to do this, and parents love it. Parents would love, and parent councils, I don't know how strong yours are, but some of them are really excited about a, a school garden program, and, they, and they're very capable of you know, fundraising and things like that, so that could be a big help. And that's about it. What areas are you going to? Uh, so, so the boot camp obviously is online, so anywhere is fine. The, the in-school programs is GTA, Greater Toronto Area. I am um, partnered with, educational partner with TDSB, and I am a CISP, it's like a special interest program prov provider are YRDSB and YCDSB. So those are schools, I'm approved to run my programs in those schools. If you're a private school, obviously you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, that's about it. And I am actively always working to become partners with any other school board. So if you have a school board that you know, is in the GTA and you think that you want to bring my program in, I have no problem with you know, applying to become a partner with them. Sounds good. Yes. In Sorry. In I have, but my focus is primary. Yeah. Yes. And how how much experience do you have with, with kindergarten children? A lot, and I don't like it. So, <laughs> so I'm very blunt. Uh, <laughs> a lot. I'm, I'm sorry to say that. Okay, so, 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 so let, let me be very clear. It's a good to have a laugh at the end. That's good. So, are you a kindergarten teacher? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be that. No, no, I completely understand. Believe me. You can run it for them, but please buddy them up with older students, which would be a wonderful thing to do. Yeah. Right? Because if we have that many kindergarten students, everything takes longer. They're not physically that as, as, much, as capable as older students are. So the best, the best years, essentially, that I really, really love, I, I love working with grade fives. I'm, I mean, just they're the exact correct age for this. But grade two to grade eight is, is the best. If you have grade one students or kindergartners, I would really suggest that you pair them up with older students. They're, they can be garden buddies. And that program will run fabulously, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I needed to be clear no, no, about no. that. No, no, no. <laughs> you were honest. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's okay. All right, any more questions? I think if we that's have it. any additional questions, can we email you? Of course. Like related you to you? should have my email through the thing. And I have cards here, by the way, yeah. and brochures and things like that. But my email is this. It's 
so that's CA.